Thank you, Brother Lou, Sister Lola, for the music. And uh, I want to say thank you to Macedonia Church for the opportunity to be with you this morning. And I just trust that the Lord will use this opportunity. And um, um, this morning I want to talk about what Macedonia is in the Bible. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to Acts chapter 16. This is the first place in the Bible that word Macedonia is mentioned. Macedonia was a region. There were many large cities in it, Berea and Thessalonica and Philippi. Uh, and it had a big uh, uh, part in the history of biblical Christianity and in the spreading of the gospel uh, to many cities and regions around. Macedonia was very large. And I want to start with this thought. I want to give this thought as we're looking at the church in Macedonia. I want to ask this question or answer it perhaps through the word. Church is for what? Fill in the blank. Now I cut off your fellowship earlier. Uh, church is for fellowship. Church is for singing to the Lord. Church is for the reading of the Scriptures. Church has many different functions. And so in your mind be thinking, what is church for? What is the purpose of it? And we're going to look right here in Acts chapter 16, and we're going to see what God tells us the purpose of church is, so we have a better understanding of His will for Macedonia church. In Acts chapter 16, if you would, uh, start. we're going to start in verse number 9. Yes, sir, chapter 16, verse number 9. And the Bible reads, And a vision appeared unto Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. This is the first mention of Macedonia in the Bible. And he's saying, Come and help us. So uh, church is a place for help. Church is a place where we can help each other, where we can get help from God as we get closer to Him through His Word. Uh, look at the next verse. Verse 10 it says, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Church is a place, it's a headquarters for going out and preaching the gospel. The gospel is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Creator. He is our God. He entered the world that He created and we rejected Him. We crucified Him. He died for our sins. That's not all. It says in Acts chapter 2, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that His soul was not left in hell. Listen, we deserve to die and go to hell for our sins, but the Lord Jesus Christ has paid for our offenses. No one is perfect. Everyone has a sin debt. We owe it to God. We're found guilty. You are guilty of breaking God's law. However, He loves you so much, He says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Gospel is this, that we trust that uh, we will stand before a righteous judge, God, at the end of our life. We have broken His law. We're found guilty. There is an eternal punishment and I don't want to go. You know, the good news is He doesn't want you to go either. He says He's not willing that any should, re should perish. God is, is willing rather that we would repent. He wants us to change our mind about who He is and in our heart, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He says, and thou shalt be saved. It's your job individually. It's your responsible, responsibility individually to choose to trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think you can get to heaven because you've been a good person, you will go to hell. Hell is forever. It's fire. It's torment. There's no getting out. It's not a pleasant place. But God's love is so great, He's not willing that any should perish, which is why He wants you to choose to take the gift of God, which is eternal life. You know, to go to heaven, you don't have to change your life or change your Facebook status or change how you vote. Listen, we're all found sinners. We have to change our mind about our soul, our sin, and our Savior. We have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in Him that He has finished the work and He's giving it to us. We just have to choose to believe. It's your choice. 
Notice that in Acts 16, verse 10. They called us for to preach the Gospel. You know what church is for? It's for preaching the Gospel. It's the headquarters of preaching the Gospel. It should go forth out into the community that there is a Savior that died for the sins of the whole world. And He loved them so much, He made it free. If only they would believe. Now look at verse 12, he says, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out by the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. You know what he's saying? There's a place beside the river. Now, now correct me if I'm mistaken. Isn't this the southern prong of the St. Mary's River out here behind us right here? Hey, is this a place where prayers would be made unto God? Is this a place where people come and pray unto the Lord and look for help from God and talk to the Lord? Is it not? Notice how, how unique it is, this concept of Macedonia. And so he says, uh, prayer, listen, church is a place for Prayer. I'm going to tell you in my life, there have been many awesome prayer requests that I've seen God answer that only God can do. Things where it's just, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me, but I know it's true because He did it. And I'm not the only one. God works miracles. He is the God of miracles. The Lord Jesus Christ is the God of miracles. And you know what He says? He says, ye have not because ye ask not. And if the church isn't praying and asking for help, then you're not going to get any help. We ought to pray for one another. We ought to bear one another's burdens. We ought to go to the Lord intercessory prayer for one another. Uh, earlier this year, my wife and I created a habit of praying for the people in our church. And we said, well, it's, a, it's this week. We're picking this family. And every time we eat or we have devotions before we go to bed or whatever it is, let's remember this family throughout the day. And we pick another family for the next week and the next one and the next one. And one of the young ladies in the church said, well, I do it a little bit different. Uh, she says, I've got a family for each day of the week. you know, And, and then I've got, I have to double up on some and I do the single over here and what a neat way to just remind yourself that there are Christians that need help and we have the power to go to God on their behalf and pray for them church is a place for for prayer is it not church is a place for help it's a place to preach the gospel it's a place for prayer look at verse 14 the next verse and a certain woman named Lydia a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. Now here you go. Church is a place to worship God. I want to tell you, worship isn't what we think these days. Uh, you know, the pagan cultures, they go and bow down to a Buddha statue, or the Muslims, they get on their knees and they pray to a certain direction and all that kind of stuff. They're worshiping devils. It's not God. When we worship God, He talks about when we sing unto Him, the fruit of our lips even praise unto our God. Worship is when we honor God for who He is. You know, we worship God by serving one another, by helping somebody else. We worship God by praying. We worship God by opening the Bible. I tell you, in Psalm 138, God said, He said, I have magnified My Word above all My name. You say, here's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no name greater than Him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess at the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He says, above that name is the Bible. The Word of God. Did you know as a, as a Christian, the greatest act of worship you can do that Kenny was talking about in Sunday school? Just read it. Just get alone with God. Open it up by faith and say, Lord, what do You have for me today? Lord, I believe that You wrote this. He is the author of our salvation. And here it is. And you don't use it. You know how many people say, oh, I wish God would talk to me. And well, they will even get down and pray on their Bible. Oh, God, talk to me. And it's like, open it up. It's the answer book. It'll tell you everything you need to know. It'll tell you more than you can understand. It'll tell you the past. It'll tell you the present. It'll tell you the future. It'll tell you of great and mighty things that God's going to do. But we don't open the Bible with faith and just say, Lord, show me what's in Your Word. If we would worship God through the Bible, through the reading of the Bible, it will change your life. This is His promise. In verse 14, He says something else though. He doesn't just stop there. He says that this, this woman Lydia who was uh, 
holding the candle, if you will, and just, just kind of worshiping God and looking for an answer. And God sends this man Paul to just bring in the torch. And she's worshiping God. Look what it says in verse 14. Uh, heard us. She listened to the preaching. She heard us whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. You know what church is for also, guys? It's not just for preaching the Gospel. It's also for preaching the doctrine. Doctrine is what God teaches us is right and wrong. And that's why we have Sunday school hour. So we can go through a few verses and say, God said do this. God said don't do that. You make Him happy when you do this. And boy, He's going to punish you if you do that. This is called doctrine. We understand who God is, the nature. Uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. That's doctrine. There's only one God. These three are one God. He tells us in Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us make man in our image. Well, how is God in our? Well, He says there's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, He says that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. All I can see is your body. But you have an eternal soul that's going to depart one day from your carcass, and it's going into eternity. If you have not chosen in your heart to humble yourself and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will end up in hell. That's a fact. But God loves you so much. He's not willing any should perish. He's a jealous God. He is a jealous God. He wants us. He wants His, he wants his creation to worship Him and hear Him. Church is a place for what it's saying in verse 14, hearing what was spoken. Church is a place for the preaching of the doctrine of the Bible so that we understand God's will for our life. You know God's greatest will? This is way off topic, but uh, He was touching on it this morning in Sunday school. And I'll just, I'll tell you, in John chapter 6, verse 40, He tells us exactly what His will is. This is the will of Him that sent Me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. You know what the will of the Father is? Is that you would believe on the Son and have everlasting life, and He promises, I will raise you up at the last day. There is a resurrection coming that we get to look forward to. That's His promise. His will is that we would trust the Son and be saved with everlasting life. Now, in Acts 16, where we're at, I want you to see this verse 15. This thought continues. And when she was baptized... Now, wait. Now, I want you to understand something. She did not get baptized to get saved. She heard the preaching in the verse before. Her heart was open and she received the truth. She gets saved... Then she got baptized after she got saved. Baptism is simply a picture that I was a dead man in my sins. I went under the water as if in the grave. And now I'm alive forevermore. I've come up out of the water just as Christ has risen out of the grave. It's a picture. It's symbolic. I thought I was saved, but then now I know that I am. And so I'm showing this outward symbol of what Christ did for me because I'm a new man by the power of the Gospel believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 15 it says, and she was baptized. She was baptized. I'm going to dig into that in one second, but before I leave this verse in this passage, I want to hit a very important word. It says, and when she was baptized and her household. Do you know what household means in the Bible? We're not talking about walls. We're not talking about walls. She was baptized and her household. That's her family. Church is a place for baptism after you're saved. Hey, church is a place for family. Church is a place for raising children. Church is a place for grandma and grandpa. Uh, church is a place for everybody. But church is God's organization for the family unit. This is where we ought to operate in. And it breaks my heart when you see youngins run off and never come back to church. Or go to some strange denomination that doesn't even preach that Jesus is God and salvation is by faith alone. You say, whoa, what, what have they gotten into? Well, they have rock and roll and they got purple lights and women up there in miniskirts with purple hair. That's not church! It's artificial. He says, when they were baptized and her household, do you know why the churches are in the state that they are today? Because we've lost our households. Church is a place for households. Church is a place 
for families. In fact, in this chapter, I'm going to skip a couple stories. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it short. Paul gets arrested for preaching, for delivering. A, there was a, a woman possessed with a, a devil. He delivers the devil. Oh, they're like, well, we made money off of her. We should go arrest this man, Paul, and lock him up. And they do, and they take him, they put him in jail. Him, Paul and Silas, if you're still in Acts 16, look at verse 25, it says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. What is he doing? He's in prison. He's supposed to be down and depressed and upset. And oh no, it's, you're never going to get out of here. This is terrible. No, what were you talking about this morning? Joy. Joy. When you're in prison, you can't take my joy. He wouldn't be the first. You look at Daniel. You look at Joseph. It doesn't matter where I'm at. I've got Jesus with me. And you can't take that joy. No man taketh his joy, he says. Boy, what a great promise God has, right? So they're praying and singing in prison like there's nothing to it. They're locked up. They're in the inner de detention center, it says. They beat them with many stripes. They lock them up. They put them in the, the, the inner containment, whatever you call it. But then God miraculously causes an earthquake. The doors pop open. The chains pop off of their hands. It's a miraculous event. The jailer scared to death. Verse 27, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors opened, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. He wakes up and, oh, everything's open and the chains are busted and I'm a dead man. They're going to kill me when they find out I was asleep on the job. I'm just going to kill myself and save them some time. Paul had a better idea. Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Paul says, Don't do it. Wait. Then he called for a light and sprang in, and trembling he fell down before Paul and Silas. He's scared to death. He gets the light and he goes and finds them, right? And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This man was ready to kill himself. And he's like, hey, this is obviously a miracle. This is of God. I know what they said of these men. I know what happened in the city. I know the politics of it. But this is of God. What do I have to do to be saved? I'm wretched. I'm a sinner. I know I deserve help. What do I have to do? Paul says, well, first, you have to be baptized as a baby. Then you have to be circumcised. Then you have to go through an eight-week course. Then you have to read the whole Bible. You have to stop all of your sins. You've got to go to church every week. You've got to give 10% of your income. Is that what he said? That's not what he said. Look at this. Look at verse Look. He says in verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. He said, What do I have to do? I want to go to heaven. Believe. Yeah, but I can't do that. Why? Well, because I saw something on TV on the History Channel, and they said it wasn't Jesus. It was an alien. Okay, then your faith is in the television. Turn off the television and believe the Bible. Believe God. Believe the Creator. Believe the Holy Spirit that made you. He bears witness with your spirit. All men are born with light. All men are born with that light inside of them. It says that Jesus Christ is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Then he gets on to John 3, and he says, But men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Well, I've already done those sins, and I don't know about that church stuff, and I'll just, I, you know, I don't know if I want to believe it. There's your problem. If you don't want to believe in Jesus, don't believe in me. Don't believe in this structure. Don't believe in another uh, organization. You believe in Jesus as God, the one that loves you so much. He took your sin, the sin you've already committed, and the sin that you will, the sin that you've forgotten about, and the sin that you hope no one finds out about. He knows. And you'll answer to Him one day. And if you trust in Him and you plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. He says you are sealed unto the day of redemption. He puts a seal around your soul that the world can't get to. The old man is here. The old flesh and the old habits. Boy, we've got to fight that battle every day to become, make our flesh better for God's glory. But it's not going to change your eternal status, which is saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You let the Holy Spirit in and He'll stay. Then you know what He's going to do? Well, he's going to start cleaning the place up. If you told me, hey, Pastor Fannin, come on. You, I want you to live in my house. Move on in. I said, sure. Yeah, move, bring everybody. Okay, we're moving in. 
we get in there, no sir, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm just, I don't really like that decoration. I'm gonna pull this thing down and you know, we're gonna clean these walls up and I'm gonna paint it a little bit and I don't like that rock and roll poster you got. I'm gonna take it and all these movies, we don't watch these movies anymore. I wanna get rid of those. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to move in and do. And you're like, no, 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 not that movie. I mean, that was my favorite. Not that band, I like that band. That's from back in the day. And I saw them live when I was a kid. Yeah, throw it out. The Holy Spirit does wanna move in and help you become a new person. That's after you've trusted on Christ. Too many people put the cart before the horse. Well, I brought all this sin I'm willing to give up, and I'll put it at the altar, and if he'll take it, then we're good. That's not what it's about. It's in here. Repent. Repent means to change your mind. Will you change your mind that Jesus is a loving God that loves you so much He wants you to go to heaven. But He's a gentleman. He's not going to twist your arm and force you. He's given you a choice. It's up to you. It's up to you. I want to point out in verse 31, though, if you're still in the text, look at Acts 16. Verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house. These are the three most beautiful words in the Bible. You know what he says? Hey, Dad, you get saved and you change your life. And then Dad says, well, come on in and preach to the whole family. Man, this is so good. i got to share it with the people that I love because they're lost and on their way to hell. And if somebody doesn't tell them, they will go to hell. And thy house. When God says something, He usually says it more than once, doesn't He? Now, we just saw household earlier in this chapter, but pay attention. He's going to say it a couple more times. Look at the next verse, verse 32. And they spake unto Him the word of the Lord. This wasn't Paul's opinion. This wasn't Paul's testimony of a life change. No, 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 no. The preaching of the word of God. And they spake unto Him the word of the Lord and to all that were in His house. What does it mean when it says house? family it's not talking about the brick and mortar and the wood and the carpet no no family he spoke the gospel to El the family in his house look he says it twice in thy house in verse 31 all that were in his house in verse 32 he doesn't stop there look at verse 33 and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes so they cleaned up Paul where he was beaten And then what did he do? He turned around and baptized them because they believed in verse 31. They were saved by trusting Christ in verse 31. And he was baptized and all his straight weight. This is the jailer's family. All his. Somebody says, y'all go to that Macedonia church? Yeah, me and all mine. (laughs) All (laughs) y'all. That's a very southern phrase. It's actually King's English. You know, King James Bible. Ye all is abbreviated as y'all. So it's plural. And all mine came with me today, and here we are, just as this man who trusted in Christ and all his that did also got baptized as a picture that now they were forgiven of their sins and they were were, were to walk in newness of life just as Christ was resurrected from the dead. And we will be one day also. But he said that's three times. Look at verse 4. He says it again. Verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, And rejoice, there's that joy, believing in God with all His house. Man, oh man. You know how many people in McClendon right now, I I believe you could go to and say, hey, where's your children? I don't know. Let me give you some sad testimonies for a minute. I've had more than one preacher, other pastor of another church come to me and say, Pastor Fannin, here's my son's address. Would you go and preach the Gospel to them? I had a lady just last week, last Sunday, call me. She's from California. And she says, I, I've been watching your sermons on the internet. I watch on YouTube. I'm thankful for what I see. I have a daughter that lives in St. Augustine, and I need to get her saved. Can you send me some information about the gospel? So I'm, I'm praying that somehow you can get over there to her and help her get saved. You know how many people today would testify, I wish that my whole family was saved. I wish that my brothers and sisters were saved and I wish that my cousins were saved and and some of you, I wish that my mommy and daddy were saved. I mean, this breaks my heart and it does God's too. He made it easy. But you know what they won't do? I can't do that. But I have come on. 
I believe in science. Science means knowledge. And I'm here to tell you something. Every scientific fact that the Bible teaches has been backed up and discovered by modern so-called science. Or the Bible calls it science falsely so-called. When your public school system says, well, you know, there's about 400 different genders and you can pick whatever you want to be today. Well, the Bible says in the beginning he made them male and female. Period. It's done. That's it. You're one or the other and whatever God made you, you ought to be what he made you. And you go against nature, it will catch up on you. Now he'll give you a reprobate mind and then he'll give you AIDS and diseases in your body and it'll just fall apart. We live in a society today where they'll say anything but God, anything but the Bible. Oh, that's not the answer. I can't believe that. It's, it's not that they can't. It's as the Pharisees said in John chapter 12 that they couldn't, they wouldn't believe it. Not Christ. We expected the Christ to be a Pharisee just like us. And we expected Him to kick out the Romans and give us gold and power and set up a kingdom now where we can rule on the earth now. That's not what it's about. Not in this life, no sir. Well, there is a resurrection coming. There is a resurrection unto life. And there is a resurrection unto damnation, unto death, eternal. And God is not willing that any should perish. And in your mind right now, you have to decide which one is for me. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? That He as God was the perfect sacrifice. The Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world and you trust in Him, and you're in His hand, He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, no man will pluck you out of My hand. Or are you still kind of undecided? Well, I don't know. We'll see. I've heard stories about the Bible. I've heard the stories about preachers and churches. Yeah, we all have. I know it's sad that those that claim the name of Christ represent Him so poorly. It is sad. If you would go to Romans 6, and I'd like to finish there, please. Just a couple pages and just a couple more minutes. I'm not going to ask you for an emotional response. I don't want to manipulate you. I don't want to trick you. I want to give you all the facts because you have to choose for yourself. If it were up to me, I would pick everybody to go to heaven. And, it's not, and it doesn't end at heaven. You realize there's more that plays out in God's timeline. There is a new heaven and a new earth. And this old earth will pass away. It says the, the elements will melt with a fervent heat. God will take hell and everybody in hell and He will judge them according to their works and then He will cast them into the lake of fire which is the second death. You know, there's something worse than death. It's called the second death. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There's something worse than suffering in your body a little bit. You get to that end and wondering, oh Lord, is this it? Where do I go next? And it says, in, and what is it, Luke 16? And he lift up his eyes in hell. The very moment that he passed from this body, the rich man went to hell. It's fire. It's torment. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. God's promise is true. He loves you. He expects you to make a decision. Not choosing is the same as saying no. You guys ever follow the GPS to drive? Well, the road, there's a split up on the road here. And if we keep going, we're going to end up going left. But the GPS is saying I've got to go right. And I hear this council saying, hey, you need to turn to Christ. You've got to turn. You've got to make a decision. You've got to move your heart. You've got to change your mind. I don't know. I just don't feel like making a decision. You lift up your eyes in hell. It's over. It's too late. And then you're judged by your works. Look, as a Christian, we're not saved by our works. But we're rewarded in eternity for our works. You're in Romans 6. Look at the last verse, verse 23. This is my absolute favorite verse of the entire Bible. It's pure gold. This is so precious. The whole gospel is in this one verse. I, I love John 3.16. I think this is better. Look what it says. It says, for the wages of sin is death. You know what wages are? That's a payment that you deserve. Now here's an illustration. If I came to you and I said, remind me again your name, brother. Richard Hunter, if I said, Richard, Brother Hunter, I need $20. And you say, okay, mow my grass. 
Well, I'd say, well, okay, I mow the grass and I come back and I say, give me that $20 you owe me. That's my wages, right? Right? Well, God has said, if you break my law, you have a wage that he owes you and it's called hell. The wages of sin is death. Sin is the transgression of the law, he tells us in 1 John 3, 4. So sin is when I break God's law and I do something he says not to do or I don't do what he does say to do. I've got a problem. He says there's a punishment. It's called death. He's not just talking about the death of the grave. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. When I break God's law, I deserve to go to hell. The wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. But here's the most beautiful words you'll ever hear, especially if you choose to believe it and put it in your heart. Look what he says. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God wants to give you a gift, and he calls it eternal life. Now, how long does eternal life last for? Forever. Forever, right? But he says, the word that I love here is gift. Forgiveness of sins is the gift of God. And I use an illustration. Hey, I've got a free gift. Who wants a Bible? You want a Bible? Would you like a Bible? Oh, I'm good. No, thank you. Not interested. Well, then you didn't take the gift. God says, I have a gift for you. It's called eternal life. It costs you absolutely nothing. All you have to do is believe I'm offering it to you. Reach out your hand and take it and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What a beautiful picture. The rest of the world, religions, and I do mean even some of the false Christian religions, will bring your good works and let's see you change. And where's your money at? And we want you sitting in our pew. That's not salvation. Never was. It's your heart. Open your heart. Let God come in. He'll stay. He'll protect you. He'll preserve you. He'll take you home with Him and give you brand new life while you're alive here. The gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here, i got a free Bible for you. Oh, I'll give you five bucks for it. No, thank you. It's free. Do you believe me? Do you believe me? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help any in here that's not saved to believe in you. Lord, it's not my testimony. It's not my church. It's not about my Bible. It's not about my opinion or my politics. Oh, Lord God, I know that You've died for all of us. And You do love us so much. Lord, You bear witness of these things with the power of Your Holy Spirit, the things that are unseen. Lord, I just ask that if there's anyone here that's not saved, You would prick their heart. Lord, I pray that You would break their heart. I pray that You wouldn't give them any sleep or peace until they call out unto You asking for the gift of God, which is eternal life. Lord, thank God that we can be saved by relying on You, trusting in You, just just believing Your promise. Lord, I thank You for this Macedonia church. Lord, I ask that if there's something our church, Law of Liberty, can do to help it, You'd make it clearly evident and that You would do all the work. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.